Welcome to the first episode of Hitting the Field. I'm your host, Connor Engelhart, and alongside me here is Lindsey Gravina and Joshua Thicklin. Josh, let's not waste any time because there was a huge upset this weekend at UFC 193. Holly Holm shocked the world by knocking out Ronda Rousey in the second round. Josh, what are your thoughts on the fight and that brutal knockout? Um, ultimately, I think that this fight exposed a lot of weaknesses in Ronda's game. And we saw that Holly, with an excellent striking performance and also excellent footwork, was able to dodge and really fluster the champ. And we saw that she was dominated from beginning to end. Yeah, now moving on to a more serious topic. The last, last week's players from the University of Missouri boycotted for the removal of the president, Tim Wolf. Lindsay, what's the future impact that Missouri could face from the NCAA from this boycott? Um, well, I think more more incidences like this could happen. I mean, a football, basketball, I mean, there's they have a lot of a media attention. And things like this where they feel empowered or like they have a strong opinion on, they're going to get the attention like Mizzou. I mean, it was profound what they did. It was good what they did. And I think it could get out of hand if people just start getting the, an idea that something's bigger than it is. But I think in this case, I think it was a great, what they did was a, a good thing. And I think it helped um, bring light to a really disturbing cause that was happening at Mizzou. But I think we could see more things like this. And the NCAA just needs to kind of make sure things like this don't get out of hand. But in this case, I think Mizzou did the right thing. Um, I agree with Lindsay that this will probably be a model for future big, big level programs like Mizzou uh, into handling situations. Um, that's imagining a boycott with all major schools for students to get paid. This could definitely be a possibility, and also for the fact that when we see stuff like this, we also I think the players realize the power that they possess, and that's going to be something really interesting moving forward. Now. Lindsay, where does the University of Missouri go with this, and what does the football team do with the situation going forward? Well, I think the university as a whole just needs to like unite. After uh, the president was uh, stepped down, I think that was a good a good sign of what they did was it, it was had meaning and was going to move forward in a good way. And I think the whole team just needs to uh, unite, and the school just needs to unite and realize that this is all big uh, racism is is a terrible thing and that they they just need to come together and realize is that each other's differences are are good and I don't know it's just it's been a problem and I think Mizzou handled it well I believe that um, the players at Mizzou as well as the students at the University of Missouri really understand that the removal of President Wolf won't end racism at their campus it's not that's not how it works but then I know they also probably understand that the first step they have to take is to establish a culture where they feel that everyone is included and that they, they um, those students feel that their problems are going to actually be heard. Now with the new president um, and also a new coach following the season because um, Coach Finkel is going to be uh, resigning due to health reasons, it's a great start for Mizzou. It's going to be a great start for Mizzou and uh, they'll have a great opportunity to really you know shed light on something very important. Now, it wasn't just the football players that were protesting a whole group of students actually formed a circle on the campus basically their memory mall at Missouri and they they had tents set up they were protesting out there and they weren't even allowing media at first to you know watch this situation so it's a big situation because they were really just standing as a whole as a school so that's why this situation could bring many more opportunities in the future from happening for schools you know to basically you know, wrap things up. So moving on to the Greg Hardy situation, you know, a lot of situations have happened in the NFL with domestic violence, and Greg Hardy, he's been given a chance by the Dallas Cowboys. But, Lindsey, do you think he really has, should be given a second chance because he really hasn't shown anything, you know, that he's changed? Yeah, I don't know. He seems like a loose cannon to me. Um, he, he kind of, like, has disputes with teammates. He, I mean, he allegedly, like, pushed one of the coaches coming off one of the games. And he, he dispute or, like, starts yelling at, like, opposition's fans. Like, it, it kind of seems like he's all over the place. And I don't know if a second chance is something he actually deserved. Um, and I think the whole domestic violence case with the NFL, they're, they're not handling it. In my opinion, I don't think they're handling it as well as they could be. Um, and I know that every situation is different, and I think with uh, the woman not showing up to the second court hearing, all of that just kind of played into his hand. But I think I think his second chance was kind of, at this point, I don't think he deserved it. He's kind of all over the place. 
ultimately, I feel like it's kind of sad that um, in our society that we need photos, we need videos, we need evidence um, for us to be outraged by domestic violence. Um, we saw a similar case with Ray Rice earlier um, this earlier last season, and where we had enough video to you know to kind of draw the conclusion that his wife, his fiance, had been assaulted, and it wasn't until we saw the full footage that there was an outcry and there was a change and stuff about it. And that is a part of our culture that needs to change. Uh, we need to take these matters more seriously, and we hope that the NFL has learned and takes them more seriously. Now, there have been multiple accusations and situations of people in the, with domestic violence in the NFL. And have people like Greg Hardy and Ray Rice, has their situations you know, affected the reputation of the NFL? Oh, I think so, most definitely, uh, especially with uh, Ray Rice. I feel like everybody was going after Roger Goodell and uh, like getting angry at him for not taking action sooner. And I think even with Greg Hardy, I mean, it, it's a similar situation, but every case is a little different. Um, I think I think the NFL is kind of lo losing control. I don't think they have a good control over what's going on. I mean, these athletes are rich and they, they try and take advantage of people. And, and, this, and not everyone's like that, obviously, but... I think sometimes they're just not good at keeping roping this situation in. Um, I feel that the NFL, um, they were one of the, the first league to really have to address it. For a lot of long time, there was nothing in place. So, you know, it's kind of like, oh, we're kind of making it up as we go. So as far as Greg Hardy is concerned and his reputation like affecting the NFL, having him on the field isn't a good look. But, you know, he has every right to be there. He's, uh, he, you know, legally he has every right to be there. And the Cowboys, if they hadn't picked him up, somebody else would have. And they have to stick behind their guy. So mm -hmm. it's an awkward situation for a lot of people. Yeah, Greg Hardy, his use of social media hasn't been the best. But coming up after the break, the MLS playoffs are a couple of weeks in. But does anyone really care? And also in soccer, headers are banned at the youth level until they turn from the age of eight, 11. So Troy Kless sounds off on this new rule coming up after the break. Dangerous driving extends beyond just speeding, especially in the rain where light usage can be the most dangerous thing you do. This high performance sports car might be able to handle tight corners in the rain, but if the driver can't see drivers around him, it just doesn't matter. Driving with your hazard lights on is illegal in the state of Florida, regardless of weather conditions. Hazard lights are only to be used while stopped on the side of the road. It makes it easier for emergency services to distinguish cars stopped on the shoulder. Not driving with your hazards on also makes turn signals clearly visible along with brake lights. Increasing the visibility of your car in the rain will make your trips infinitely safer. And of course remember that speed is the most important thing you can control while driving in severe weather. Speed and low grip are a deadly combination at any level of driver skill. For more information, visit your local Florida Department of Transportation office or the website shown below. Control the roads and enjoy the journey. Florida is the perfect place to study, earn a degree, and of course, to enjoy everything that Central Florida has to offer. From theme parks to dinner shows, and of course, the movies, Orlando offers many unique and exciting activities to do. However, we all know that a ticket to any of these attractions can be expensive, especially on a college student budget. UCF Student Government Association has the nights covered with the SGA Ticket Center. Located at the heart of campus inside Student Union, SGA Ticket Center offers tickets at a special discounted price to UCF students, faculty, and staff. Not only do they have discounted tickets for theme parks, but they also have discounted tickets for other attractions like Blue Man Group, Pirates Dinner Adventure, and Kennedy Space Center. Save your money and experience all Orlando has to offer. For more information, you can visit their website. Welcome back to Hitting the Field. The, ML, the MLS playoffs have been going on for a couple of weeks now, but does anyone really care? Eric, as a soccer fan, do you care about the MLS playoffs? It's tough because domestically, as the U.S. men's national team progresses for 2018, I do care. Uh, you've like seen the likes of Darlington Nagby, Sasha Kleschen. In these playoffs, they've been able to get some touches, be able to play some minutes. So domestically for the U.S. fans, they have to be happy because you're not seeing the likes of Gerard or... or um, uh, Kaka in these playoffs. You're seeing some players that were homegrown, and, and for U.S. fans, that's exciting. But the, the reality is the top five teams in total attendance this year 
no one's left in the playoffs. Uh, Seattle, the LA Galaxy, Orlando City. Um, these teams are left out of the playoffs. And at the end of the day, it's not about just how I feel. How does the U.S. fans feel? And are those regional markets going to be enough to help the MLS out? I think they do have some, you know, potential growth there in those small markets, like in Columbus and up in New York, the Red Bulls, you know, they've been hot throughout the year, the number one seed going into the playoffs and still pretty strong, you know, being able to battle against teams like DC United. I think the fans of those teams, like the Columbus Crew and Portland Timbers as well, those homegrown teams that really stuck to their city, they care. But as far as the national fan base, I think we kind of lost amongst, you know, the we're right in the middle of the NFL season. Basketball is starting to pick up as well. And, you know, maybe some people still have a little bit of hangover from baseball season being over. But, you know, it's, t- it's tough for, you know, those teams and, you know, for them to, you know, get the viewership that, you know, the MLS is striving for. But with these big players coming overseas, I think, or coming from overseas, I think it does a ter- has a tremendous boost to the league. Now, what about the big name players? Have they really helped attract the attention to the MLS? Well, you've seen that New York already. Uh, they brought in so many big-time players. They weren't able to ma- make it work. The coach is gone. They bring in Patrick Vieira. We're going to see next year how it's going to work out. But these big-time players need to make an impact now. Yeah, especially, I mean, even for teams like LA Galaxy, have been able to bring in players like David Beckham and Steven Gerrard and having those big national team players like Giassi Zardes as well. So it's, it's been a good run for the MLS, I think. On the note of American soccer, the U.S. Soccer Federation recently announced after a class action lawsuit that heading the ball will be taken out of the youth level. Troy, what's your take on it? Okay, just to get some background information to the fans, this was the result of a class action lawsuit in California where a former youth player, Rachel Murr, was representing players and parents at the youth level, and they said that the U.S. Soccer Federation was being negligent as far as these concussions were going. So Soccer Federation decided they're going to ban heading at the ages of 10 and under, and and they're going to restrict it in practices and games for ages between 11 and 13. However, it's I have some mixed feelings about it. It sends a message to other sports leagues at the youth level and at the professional level that they can curb these sorts of things in the games and you know still not take away from the integrity of it. It could teach players to you know be able to control the ball without the head and bring it down to your feet and you know of course less injuries but that brings me to the cons where I think it's a huge setback for the development of US, of US soccer players I mean you know what are international teams gonna think England and Germany they're not concerned with this at the moment mm-hmm. yeah and so we're gonna take a quick break coming back we have college football. It's halfway through the season. Brett West and Daniel Bird will tell us who their top four teams are so far. Plus, Golden State is off to a hot start in the NBA. Josh and Eric will discuss why they've been so effective so far this season. Tonight on Deals After Dark. When I think of quality sunglasses, I think of boldness, but simplicity. And nothing provides both of those more than this set. Tonight, We have a pair of beautiful used matte black Oakley Holbrook sunglasses. These glasses offer an American frame accented with metal rivets and Oakley icons, perfect for buyers seeking performance and style. And do we have a deal for you guys tonight? For the next 40 seconds, that's right, 40 seconds, you have a chance to get your hands on this exclusive featured price of $110 or best offer. This deal, usually only available on Craigslist, could be yours for the eight super easy payments of $13.75. Wow, uh, I'm now hearing that we've actually gone down to one single pair. So if you're interested in this deal or any other products from our program, you can always log on to dealsafterdark.com or call us at 1-800-555-DEAL. See you next time. There are many scary things in this world, but what really frightens the seeds out of me is going the fall season without the Night of the Living Dead. I'm not talking about the movie, I'm talking about Magic Hat's new fall variety pack. Inside the Night of the Living Dead, there is the Wilhelm Scream, which is infused with the most important fall flavor, pumpkin of course. Then there's Miss Bliss, who is rich with citrus, but a little bitter, probably about last night. You can't forget about the mysterious number nine. It's dry, it's crisp, it's a pale ale, but not really. Lastly, the resurrected ale, the brew that has come back to life to haunt you with the Irish taste that started it all. 
Begin the new season with Magic Hat's Night of the Living Dead, and you will experience beer that will make you scream, cry, live and die. Then come back to life as a pumpkin, like me. The New England Patriots and Car Carolina Panthers and Cincinnati Bengals are the only undefeated teams remaining in the NFL. Eric Scott and Daniel Bird join me at the desk now. Guys, who do you think will be the last undefeated team when all is said and done? I think at the end of the day, it's going to be the Carolina Panthers who are the last undefeated team in the NFL simply based off their schedule. Just look at who they play coming up. They have games against Tampa Bay, Dallas, and Washington. Those are three automatic wins in my opinion. Washington is coming off a nice win against New Orleans, but in the end, they're still a subpar team. They also have two games against Atlanta. I think they can win. They'll be favored in both of those games. The second one against at, on the road against Atlanta, I think might be the toughest game uh, for them closing out this season, but I still think they can get past that one. And they finish with the uh, New Orleans Saints and the, uh, excuse me, the New York Giants, who I think are two teams that they can get past as well, and they'll be favored in all the games. And on the flip side, if you look at New England, tough matchups against both Denver and Buffalo. Buffalo, a team that is on the rise right now. And then they have to play Miami as well, who they always are due for one loss a season. My Dolphins, you know, normally nick one off them. And Cincinnati, it's the same thing. On the road at Arizona, at San Francisco, at Denver. Three tough games. I don't think they can get through those undefeated. So I think at the end of the day, based simply off the schedule, Carolina's going to be the team that uh, gets through undefeated. Yeah, it's interesting when you talk about Carolina and Cincinnati, the balance that they're able to have on both sides of the ball, something that New England might not have. But at the end of the day for me, you go home to Buffalo, and then you go away on Sunday night football to Denver. New England, if they can just find a way to win those two games, it's going to be tough matchups. But then they play one team that's above 500, and that's New York Jets. The Patriots usually have their, their number. I believe the Patriots, you just can't count Tom Brady out. Bill Belichick, you have to trust the system. Uh, they, they prepare every week the best way they can, and, and, and it's always enough for them. Yeah, so those are the only remaining undefeated teams left in the NFL. But guys, who, who do you think is the best team in the NFL and who are the matchups you want to see in the Super Bowl, you know, between the two divisions? I think coming out of the NFC, I think the Carolina Panthers are the best team in the NFC currently, maybe the Arizona Cardinals as well. I think out of the AFC, you're going to see the Cincinnati Bengals, my team, who I think is the best team in the NFL right now. You have Andy Dalton playing at a great level, 77.6 QBR rating. Not the best, but he keeps his team in games. You got Gio Bernard and Jeremy Hill in the backfield as well. That's a good running back duo. And Tyler Eifert, I think, is the best tight end in the NFL, secondly, behind Rob Gronkowski, who's just an animal. So I think when you put all that together on the offensive uh, aspect, that they can get to the Super Bowl, and their defense does enough to keep them in games as well. Yeah, I have, I have Cincinnati and Arizona in the Super Bowl, uh, mostly because of their defenses. I know people are going to criticize us for going for Andy Dalton and getting past Tom Brady. Uh, I just see the matchup. I can see Cincinnati stopping them, finding a way to win that game. If they can just get the run game going a little bit more. It will really help them out. And then Arizona, you can trust Larry Fitzgerald, Carson Palmer. He's looked good. That defense is always on point. It's going to be interesting if, if Cincinnati and Arizona can get a matchup there in the Super Bowl. Michael Floyd's also been really good so far for the Arizona Cardinals, and their defense has been spectacular so far this season. Now let's transition from the NFL to the college game. Brett has joined us at the desk now. Brett, who, who do you have in your top four playoff right now? Well, right now I've got a number one, I've got Clemson. Deshaun Watson's been playing out of his mind. That defense is just nasty. They're stopping everyone. No one can score on them. So right now they've got my top spot. And then next, we're going to go to Alabama, the Crimson Tide. You know, everyone's been kind of like, why are they there? They've got that loss. But you look at that defensive line, nine sacks against Dak Prescott. Are you kidding me? That's unreal. And Jacob Coker is finally starting to play. And you can't forget about that bad man, Derrick Henry. Over 200 yards rushing in two straight games. Probably the number one Heisman guy right now. Definitely the leader, in my opinion, right over Leonard Fournette. So that's why I got them at number two. And then we can get number three, Notre Dame. Next man up. They've got... You know, so many injuries, but it seems like one guy goes down, the next guy comes up. And you know what? That's great for a team because you're going to deal with injuries for the rest of the year. And then Deshaun Kaiser, he's like in that next man up situation. You know, their starting quarterback goes down. He steps in. He's been playing really, really well. And then you got Will Fuller. He might be the best wide receiver in the country, only behind Corey Coleman. But you know what? That offense, that defense, they've got a well-balanced team. And then number four, just put in this week as Oklahoma after that big win over Baylor. You go into Baylor, a hostile environment. You come out with the win. Baker Mayfield had a great game. I like them, and I love Eric Stryker as that linebacker. He's just been great. 
So just to be clear, but you have three one-loss teams in your top four at the moment. Hey, man, they're playing the best ball right now. That's what you got to do. Wow. Okay. I'm going to tweak it just a little bit. Number one for me is Alabama. I think the best all-around team right now. Like you said, their defense is ridiculous. Derrick Henry, my Heisman winner at the moment, too. I think they're just all-around the best team in college football. Number two, I'm going to go with Clemson. I don't think they've done enough for me to earn that number one ranking, but I think number two is fitting for them. Number three, Ohio State. Not hold on the resume to prove that they should yeah, be a playoff have team. A top That's team. true, but as a defending champion, I think you got to give them some respect. I think number three fits them yeah, just fine. Florida State. Hey, Florida State has two <laughs> losses now. Hang on one no, second. I'm talking about last year. On the field. True. All right, fair enough. But they still made it, and they still. They got blown Aside from a couple fumbles, they're in that game. I, I still fully believe that. Number four, Oklahoma State right now. And, again, this one's going to come down to who wins Oklahoma Oklahoma State personally for me at the end of the season. But right now, they have the best win, I feel like, in the Big 12. Baylor, I don't have a whole lot of confidence in, so I don't Oh, yeah, they lost the starting that. quarterback. It's a hard thing to Exactly. Overcome. So I don't really judge that loss as a – or that – now, guys, yeah. do you have one surprise team that you can pick so far from this college season? You know, we were, actually, we were talking about this earlier. I think it's North Carolina. They've just been blowing out everyone. No one can stop that offense. Marquise Wilson, I mean, they're on fire. 125 points the past two weeks. You can't stop them. Now, let's switch gears and make some picks for this week's college games. Let's start right here on the UCF campus with East Carolina taking on the UCF Knights. Brett, who do you have in this game? Man, I, got, I guess I got to go with the Knights. I just feel bad picking against them. You know, they looked really good against Tulsa. Looks like they're finally starting to turn around. First bye week of the year. Maybe they get some extra scouting. You know, everyone gets rested up. I got the Knights. Yeah, same thing. You got to go with the home team. I think finally this is a game that we can win to get off this uh, really killer losing streak. I'm also going to go with the Knights. You know, I think they'll get the victory finally at home on Thursday night. Should be a good one. Now let's switch over to Michigan State versus Ohio State. This is a big game. When you say, Brett, who do you got? Yeah, this is a huge game. This might be the deciding factor of who wins this division in the Big Ten. I got Ohio State. You know, Connor Cook's injured. That's a big loss. So even if he's, like, part kind of hurt, they can't overcome that. Barrett looks like he's finally got that offense rolling. I got Ohio State. Too much offense, I think, for Ohio State. No matter who's that quarterback for them, I think they roll over Michigan State by about 10 points. I'm going to take Michigan State. I still feel, you know, that game against Michigan was a tough break, but I'm still going to go with Michigan State. The next game, we're going to move over to the Big 12. we got Baylor versus Oklahoma State, matchup between two great offenses. You know, I think I'm going to go with Baylor on this one, actually. You know, that, that offense moved the ball enough against Oklahoma, against Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State last week barely pulling out against Iowa. That makes me nervous. You know, Iowa State is not a good team, and Baylor, I think they're just going to find the rhythm. I think uh, t uh, Corey Coleman's going to come back and really light it up. I got Baylor. Everyone has hiccups, though, through the season, especially in the Big 12. I think last week was an anomaly for this Cowboys team. I have them beating Baylor. I think Baylor's not as good as they used to be. They're in my playoffs, so i got to keep Oklahoma State rolling. Yeah, I'm going to take Baylor in that matchup, and let's stay in the Big 12 with TCU taking on Oklahoma. Oh, I got Oklahoma rolling them. I got them winning by about 20 points at least. You know, uh, Trayvon Boykin goes down. He, is he even going to play? You know, even if he does play, he's got an ankle injury, and he's a running quarterback, so that ankle injury is going to catch up to him. I think Eric Stryker and that defense is going to shut him down, and Baker Mayfield is going to just torch that defense. TCU with the upset. I think people have written them off after how their season's gone so far. I like the Horned Frogs. I'm going to stick with Oklahoma, stay safe on that pick. Let's switch over to the SEC. We got LSU taking on Ole Miss. Brett, who do you have? You know, I've been back and forth about this one. I'm not I'm not sure. I, it, each team has had bad performances. They've had good performances, but I think that Ole Miss is going to pull this one out. Laquan Treadwell, Chad Kelly, and I think that defense is going to figure it out. Looks like everyone's starting to learn how to stop Leonard Fournette, stack the box and make Brandon Harris beat you. I just don't think he can do it. I think Brandon Harris has one good token game against Florida, and now I just think they're going to blow. I think they're going to beat him by about 10 points or so, so I got Ole Miss. Completely agree with Fournette and making Harris beat you, but I do think there's no way Les Miles loses three straight games, so I have LSU winning. Somehow they pull this one out. Yeah, I'll also take LSU. And let's move on to a possible upset game. We got Boston College going to Notre Dame. Brett, I know this is a big one for Notre Dame. <laughs> I got Notre Dame, and I just don't think Boston College has the talent to keep up with them. I think they're going to roll them. At Fenway Park, Notre Dame's going to beat them 21-3. Yeah, I'll also take Notre Dame as my home team. And let's go to an interesting matchup. We have an Ivy League game between Harvard and Yale. Brett, I know this is a different game for us to pick, but who do you have? You know, I got Harvard in this one. They had their 22-game winning streak snap, and I think they're just going to be really upset, and they're going to they're come out here, and they're just going to, you know, they're going to beat Yale. The Ivy League is tight right now, three-team race, and I think Harvard stays in that race. They beat uh, their rivals, Yale. I'm going to go with Yale on this one, always willing to take a different approach to life. Let's switch over to the NBA. 
Golden State are off to a hot start this season that can only be compared to the 96 Bulls. The Brooklyn Nets took the Warriors to overtime on Saturday but fell short. Josh, can anybody stop Golden State so far this season? I feel there are two teams that have a great chance of stopping the Warriors. Um, it would have to be the San Antonio Spurs and the Los Angeles Clippers. So for the Spurs, for both of these teams, they have two things I feel that the Warriors lack in, which is depth and also like a strong front court. Um, so let's start. I'll start with the Clippers. With the Clippers, their new bench. You have Lance Stevenson. You have Paul Pierce. You have Jamal Crawford. Like you have a, a two-time Sixth Man of the Year, uh, Hall of Famer, and a possible like you know a Most Improved Player of the Year all on your bench. All right. So that's the first thing to start off. But also when we look at their front court, Blake Griffin and DeAndre Jordan is a better matchup than Draymond Green and Andrew Bogut any day of the week, twice on Sundays. Okay. That's the first thing. We go on and when we go over to the Spurs, we look. They have a similar situation. Lamarcus Aldridge and Tim Duncan in the paint. They can't match. They really can't match. And also, you have David West coming off the bench. Like, I feel like that's going to be the disparity when it comes to them. Also, let's not forget about Sugar K. Leonard, who's playing out of his mind. And if they put him on Curry, it's a wrap, personally to me. For me, the team, it's going to be Cavs. When they get Kyrie and Iman Shepard back, it's a different team. You see Mo Williams, supposed to be a role player, coming in, putting double-doubles up like it's nothing. Um, Kyrie Irving, when he gets back, it's a one-on-one -on -one matchup for Steph Curry that can, that can live up to the hype. Um, you need somebody who can play point guard against Steph Curry that's going to make him play defense because you know what he does on the offensive side of the ball. The thing about Golden State is no one ever talks about what they do on the defensive end. LeBron's going to have to start shooting better from the three-point. But I think the Cavs, they have the role players. They have the big men now with Aero Show back. They can make a run for it. Now, guys, staying in the NBA, there have been some outstanding individual performances so far this season. I know it's early, but who do you guys have as your top three MVP candidates? I know, like, you know, it's kind of really, like you said, it's really early for the MVP candidates. But for my t top three, I have Steph, Steph Curry, definitely the number one player in the league right now. Um, he's shooting 45% from the field from the three-point line. He's averaging five three-pointers per game. And let's not also forget the kid is averaging 33 points, five assists, and also, you know, it's something that we don't get to see as often. And you never really get to see MVP get better the next season. So it's really nice to look at. Uh, number two, I definitely have Andre Drummond. Um, who, you know, has been playing out of his mind for Detroit. First six game, first six game of the season, he was averaging a 2020, which is only Wilt Chamberlain has ever done it. So I think that's something we really have to look forward to, um, his growth and his development. And number three, I have Russell Westbrook, who's nearly averaging a triple-double with averaging like 28 points, eight rebounds, uh, and, you know, 10 assists. Eric, can you quickly go through your top three? Yeah, three, LeBron. We know what the best player in the world can do. And number two, Russell Westbrook. He's a mismatch for anyone at the point guard position. His size, his speed. He's, he's well, done well on that jump shot. And then Steph Curry. Uh, mismatch everywhere. He's shooting the three wonderfully. That's the best player right now on the planet. Now, Josh, I know there, you have an interesting scenario right now. The base god has been relevant in the sports world. Can you go into a bit of depth? about the base god. Okay, so superstition is something that's very, you know, it's common um, in the world of sports. So this year, the X Factor has been Little B and the base god curse. If you don't know, Little B is a rapper from the Bay, and he's cursed everyone from Kevin Durant, former MVP, NBA superstar, when Kevin Durant calls him whack, and he refused to play him in one-on-one, -on -one, and he placed a curse on him. Ever since then, he said KD will never win a title. He said, and he also, and he also said that, you know what, you won't ever do anything. So he's been injured ever since that's happened and played with injuries. Then James Harden, he's the validation of the curse. Um, James Harden did not attribute his now world famous cooking dance to Little B, who started it. And for that, James Harden came to the game during the playoffs against the Golden State. And James Harden had the worst game of his career, having 13 turnovers and, you know, the rest is history. Rockets have the worst start in NBA history with three 20 point losses in a row. The base got curse is real. So. You know, we don't know who's next for the base god, but we're going to continue on with our show because that's going to be the end of it. So tune in next week for another edition of Hitting the Field. I'm Connor Engelhart. Have a wonderful day.